We Have Ways of Making You Talk presents The Cauldron by Zeno, read by Al Murray, Chapter 8. Gorman was not certain that waking up was worse than the illusory suspension of danger granted by sleep. The platoon had stood to four times during the night and had twice opened fire on probing enemy patrols. Now he wondered what time it was, but made no move to look at his watch. To move would be to disturb and disperse the small pockets of warm air which had built up between his clothing and his skin. The inside of his mouth felt unclean and he was tired. It was a tiredness he recognised and he knew he would have to fight against continually from now on. It was a mixture of many things apart from weariness of the body. The sense of physical ill-being suffered more by junior commanders than by anyone else. Company commanders and high ranks had a buffer between themselves and immediate events. They might switch units or commit reserves, but apart from these actions they were debarred by their position from sharing the strains and pressures which were continually at work upon the platoon and section commanders who controlled the men actually in contact with the enemy. The private soldier shared the tiredness brought on by prolonged physical exertion and the constant pressures of fear and uncertainty, but when the firing stopped and the front was quiet, When someone else was the sentry, he could find time to relax and recuperate. He could abandon himself to rest and recover to some degree the strength which had been drained away from him. When the need for his presence and action arose, there would be someone else, his platoon or section commander, to tell him so and to decide what was required of him. Gorman moved, arching his back against the sudden chilling round his shoulders and knees which had been in contact with the clay of his weapon pit. If the enemy attacked now... One or other, or perhaps both of the forward sections, would be immediately in action without warning or time to prepare. Bridgman would be waiting in the darkness or crawling towards those under fire so as to know at once if either post was too badly endangered to hold out on its own. He would be holding himself ready to call Gorman's section or platoon headquarters into a counter-attack if one of the vital forward positions was overrun. Every junior commander was permanently on the alert and would have to remain so for the indefinite period during which they were in direct contact with the enemy. For days, they would only catnap, section commanders sliding from weapon pit to weapon pit, platoon commanders from section to section. For them, no opportunity would come to sit back, if not content, at least satisfied that the best dispositions had been made, knowing that from now on they could do nothing but wait on events. Gorman moved his right forefinger slightly until it touched metal, not warmed by his hand, moved the upper part of his body, feeling it slide easily inside his clothes. He turned his head, grimacing to ease the stiffness in his neck. He brought his bent knees together and hunched himself forward till his shoulders were clear of the earth behind him, and he looked at his watch. Twenty minutes past three. He had dozed for fifteen minutes since changing the last sentry and handing over to Stan Summers, his lance corporal. He sat for what seemed a long time, his sten gun resting in the V formed by his hunched body and the thin thighs which ran up to the bony knees he held together with his hand. He heard a muffled movement, a faint click, and a smothered sneeze from where the sentries, Summers and Woodley, strained their eyes into the night. He cocked his head and listened intently, his eyelids closed, screwed together by the intensity of his effort to hear. He could pick out nothing unusual, nothing that could not be explained, not even the odd shot from a nervous sentry. Silence reigned over the entire battlefield. Even the firing from the bridge had ceased. He wondered if they had at last been overrun, and if the Germans now held the really vital objective. If they did, the whole operation was a failure, and thousands of men would have been killed and wounded to no purpose. He heard a sound behind him and looked up. Bridgman spoke in a clear whisper. How's it going, Frank? All right, sir. Gorman got to his feet and leaned over the back of his trench, so that his head was only inches from Bridgman's. What's the general position, sir? You know, casualties and other units and that sort of thing. I can't be sure, Frank. You know what rumours are as well as I do. But compared to most of the division, we've been bloody lucky. When the King's Own Scottish Borderers came through a few hours ago and took up the new positions to the east of us, they were down to under 200 men. They lost two companies in the last scrap when they were trying to disengage. I hear that 10th Para are down to 250 all ranks and 156 to 270. And, of course, they're still cut off from the division. But what's happening in the town? Christ, there's five battalions there somewhere. Alan didn't answer at once. He was thinking about the men in the town, the 1st, 2nd and 3rd battalions, the famous 1st Parachute Brigade, 
who had taken the Bone airfields in North Africa and had then fought as infantry with First Army until the German surrender. The same men who had taken the bridge over the Cimeto in Sicily and had been with the division at the naval landings in Taranto Harbour. 2,000 strong, they had landed at Arnhem to take this other bridge and open the gate for the Allied victory march to Berlin. He was thinking of the names which were now more familiar to him than the names of his boyhood friends, of Johnny Frost, the commanding officer of 2nd Battalion, or what was left of it, still clinging to the northern end of the bridge, of Gerald Lathbury, the brigade commander, cut off somewhere in the centre of the town with the remnants of his other two battalions, the 11th Parachute Battalion and the 2nd South Staffs, all of them cut to ribbons by the tanks of the two German panzer divisions and all still striving desperately to get to the bridge to reinforce Frost and his depleted handful of men. There's not much left of any of them, Frank. By tomorrow there'll be nothing, or what's left of them will be back with us trying to hold a small bridgehead this side of the Rhine, while Second Army ambles along, held up by the odd German company or a single field gun that survived the 1418 war. Gorman tried to see Bridgman's face, but it was too dark, and he could only guess at its bitter expression. Surely they can't be as bad as that, sir. It's like saying that none of them have any guts at all. Oh, there's individual guts, they're all right. But it's the guts of a whole unit that really counts. They'd probably dig in and fight a defensive battle well enough. At least most of them would. It's in the attack, when they're advancing, that the trouble lies. They go to ground as soon as they're fired at and wait for the guns and the armour to sort it out. And when they've hung around for half a day, they find an 800-strong battalion that's been held up by a mediocre section of 10 men commanded by a man with a bit more determination than the average. This war was won on the day that Monty broke out at Falaise, but they'll fiddle and fart ass about until this time next year before they're finished with it. And in an effort to avoid casualties, they'll finish up with twice as many as they would have had if they'd really pulled their finger out. Bridgman's sibilant whispering ceased. Both men listened to a sudden burst of firing that came to them faintly from the direction of the bridge. It stopped as abruptly as it had started and Bridgman spoke again. Sorry, Frank, I got carried away. I don't suppose they're half so lackadaisical as I pretend. Perhaps they'll be here tomorrow or the day after. Bridgman turned and crawled away into the darkness, heading for the road and track junction where Blake and his section were dug in. Gorman went over and checked with Summers and Woodley, then made his way to the right of the section post. He found Corporal Armstrong awake, or so shallowly asleep that he was awake in an instant. It's nearly four o'clock, Ted. If you come with me now, it'll save Summers coming over for you. Don't relieve Woodley. He was only posted at three o'clock. It's the chap in the next trench, Fraser, I think. The two NCOs crawled back, and when the relief had been posted, Gorman sank down in the bottom of his own weapon pit again. He wondered how long they could go on posting two sentries and an NCO throughout the nights. So far his section had come out of it better than any in the company. He had had only one man killed and one wounded. Including Armstrong and Summers, he still had nine men, ten counting himself. Even now, his was stronger than the average infantry section. He hoped their luck would last. He wriggled his shoulders and tried to settle back, but he had to turn and remove a stone from the dry clay before he could relax and snatch a few more minutes sleep. We need to take a short break now. I'll see you in a tick. Welcome back to Zeno's The Cauldron. The company stood down an hour after dawn and Bridgman went back to the house in the rear where Major Jordan had his headquarters. He was the first of the platoon commanders to arrive and he looked into the room on the ground floor that was being used as a forward dressing station. The unique composition of the Independence Company granted it a section of Royal Corps signalers, the same complement as for a brigade, but its establishment did not include a medical officer. Each platoon had a man from the RAMC attached to it and at company headquarters Sergeant Doc Barber bandaged, cleaned and dispatched the casualties. The not too bad back to the line, the more severe to the casualty clearing stations set up by the field ambulances. Doc Barber looked very spruce in the fresh light of the morning in contrast to the veranda Alan had crossed to enter the house which was littered with blood-stained clothing and the weapons of the wounded. On the evening before, when he had looked in for a moment, he had seen Barber at work stripped to the waist and with a rubber apron about him. The room had reeked of blood, and in the shaded light behind the blacked-out windows, Alan had thought the scene might have been a ship's surgery in the days of Trafalgar. He stepped across to the room on the other side of the hall where the CO was holding his order group. Ramsden and Brown had come in, and they exchanged nods. Jordan had not shaved yet, and Alan was struck by the way in which the stubble on the CO's cheeks revealed his age as nothing else had ever done. He looked 
an old man, his face lined and haggard, his eyes dark and sunk far back in his head. He was a small man of quick, decisive movements, but now his body seemed frail and shrunken under his camouflaged smock. His rough beard showed iron grey and white in patches, and yet the dark, sunken eyes gleamed, and there was a quick smile on his face as, looking up, he offered a packet of cigarettes to his young subalterns. Well, what started as a copybook operation now seems to have gone slightly adrift. Jordan's face made a good attempt at showing only wry humour, but Alan could glimpse the cynicism lurking deep in his eyes and wondered what Jordan really thought about the chances of the division surviving, let alone securing and holding any more of its primary objectives. They would not be told now. They would hear nothing from the old man that might smack of defeatism. Bad news would come from him quietly in a series of half-humorous understatements. His orders would be directed towards the next action of their unit, as if the fate of the 10,000 men who had landed north of the Nader Rhine was a thing apart from the tight life of the independent company he commanded. The KOSBs had taken up positions to their right, rather knocked about, I'm afraid, and without much transport. The 10th and 156th battalions of the 4th Brigade would be entering the divisional area when opportunity allowed, and would probably take a fresh line on the centre of the town. It may be a little difficult for them, as Brigadier Hackett's command has now been reduced to about 500 all ranks. However, that's for the future. Frost was still holding out at the bridge, but his casualties had been very high. Jordan did not elaborate about those forces at the bridge, or their chances of survival. The battalions in the centre of the town had been badly cut up by the tanks of the Panzer SS, but reinforced by 4th Brigade, they might be able to reach 2nd Battalion. The borders and some divisional troops still held the western flank. The CO looked at each of his platoon commanders in turn and smiled tightly. We're going to stay here, I should imagine for today at least, and I should think we could expect a visit from the north from the Teutonic gentlemen who have kept 4th Brigade so busy. He turned to Alan. For you, nothing has changed since last night. You will fetch in the resupply at the map reference I gave you. The drop is due at 1400 hours. I'll see you again at midday in case there are any fresh developments by then. He sat back in his chair and addressed the rest of his remarks to all of them. There's nothing really specific I could tell you. I know the question you all want to ask. What has happened to Second Army? I'm damned if I know. I suppose they've hit far more trouble than they expected. We can only hope for the best and try to hang on to at least some of the bridgehead till they arrive. Dismissed, the officers made their way back to their platoons. Ramsden going to the west of the house, to where his platoon lay among the edge of the grounds facing the open fields and the threat of rolling armour. Alan and Gordon Brown went the opposite way, and under the trees to the east where Gordon's platoon was dug in, they stopped and talked for a few minutes. Gordon spoke, his eyes fixed on the single house held by part of his platoon, which lay in the northeast corner of the company position, where their two sectors joined. Well, what do you think, Alan? I think the same as you think. The division... He paused for a moment and then went on. I was going to say that the division is going to be cut to pieces, but it already has been cut to pieces. I did a little sum last night. I reckon we've had at least 5,000 casualties to date. The only battalion left with anything like operational strength is the Border Regiment. And they're all that stands between what's left of the division and whatever Jerry decides to throw against us from the Utrecht Rotterdam Amsterdam box. Brown looked at Alan his huge handlebar moustache seeming to bristle with the sudden indignation which wiped away the rather stoical, resigned look his face had worn while he had stared at the house. Christ! I hadn't thought about the casualties cumulatively. I have simply taken them in a bit of time as I heard them. Five thousand! Stuff me! That takes some thinking about. How long do you think we'll be able to hold on? Till we fall below brigade strength, I should think. Adlan looked at the backs of the men in the trenches on the slope. Longer, perhaps. They're good troops. With most divisions, I should say it was all over now. We've read so many times about garrisons digging in to hold out to the last man in the last round, and then the next thing you hear is that three quarters or seven eighths of them have been put in the bag. There must come a time, though, surely, when no useful purpose can be served by continuing to have men killed. Alan looked at Brown's set face, conscious of his friend's concern for the lives of those who were still fighting, and yet not feeling it himself in the same way. War is killing. If it's nothing else, it's that. I suppose a case can be made out for laying down arms if they can no longer be used to effect, but... Brown looked about the company position, at the heads and shoulders of digging men, at the upthrown earth and the cut branches of trees and bushes, which camouflaged the slit trenches. When he spoke, he spoke more to himself than to Alan. No longer effective, but who can decide that? Who draws the line? No man is God, Alan. 
I don't think you appreciate the position that commanders sometimes find themselves in, to sit alone and weigh up all the possibilities, and to decide when men shall continue to be killed and when the time has come to put a stop to it. At what stage do you think this should be stopped? Don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting that the time is now, or even fairly soon, but at what point in a battle like this do you stop the killing because nothing can be gained by continuing it? I can't answer that because I can't think about it. Bridgman took a deep breath. I don't have that sort of strength. Once you start drawing fresh lines, there's no end to it, and they always creep nearer and nearer the easy way out. I find it simpler to consider that all aspects of soldiering, of fighting, are incidental to the main purpose, killing the enemy. Other things may go by the board, but all the time any opportunity remains to do that, there should be no thought of surrender. Is there any point in having hundreds of men killed for the problematical satisfaction of killing a few more of the enemy with the last rounds that are left? It isn't a question of satisfaction. It's a question of continuing to do the only job you're still able to do. Bridgman smiled suddenly and for a moment his eyes showed an unusual warmth. The trouble with you is that you're a humanitarian, Gordon. You spend too much time thinking of the individual. It's strange that you and I should each hold our particular viewpoints. As a socialist, you should consider that the end justifies the means. As a Tory, I should be prepared to compromise. They both laughed suddenly and together and each moved as if to grip the other's arm. Alan watched Brown as he stumped off, his powerful rugby player's body looking enormous under his smock and equipment, his pleasantly ugly face scowling and frowning as he made his way down to the house. Alan realised with a sudden pang that it would matter very much to him if his friend were killed. He turned and made his way back to his command post between the two forward sections. Going down the gentle slope, he passed through Gorman's section, 25 yards to the rear and midway between the two forward positions. The section sergeant looked up. Any change of plan, sir? he asked. No, nothing new, Frank, except the CO seems to think that with 4th Brigade withdrawing through Wolfhazer, the Jerrys are likely to come down at us from over the railway line. And he might very well be right. Keep your eyes skinned and cut all movement down to a minimum. Bridgman joined Bilting in the slip trench overlooking the road and the gardens of the big house, which Murray and his composite section had occupied on the second night. The CO now considered it too far from the support of the company to be held. Bilting was busy with the tommy cooker, and within a few minutes they were drinking weak tea from unwashed mess tins. Alan studied his runner's face as he leant on the parapet, his rifle within easy reach of the hands cradling the mess tin. Bilting was a silent man and difficult to know. Apart from the fact that he was a Londoner and came from south of the river, Alan knew very little about him. It was not lack of interest on his part, but rather because Bilting was not forthcoming about himself or his family, or what he had done before he joined the army. His letters home, which Alan had to censor, were of the type common to most soldiers, dull, limited in scope and short. Things are a bit dicey, aren't they, sir? Alan was surprised. If there had been any doubt in his mind about events, it was removed, for if things appeared sufficiently bad for Bilting to comment, the situation must have got beyond the point where only one's instinct knew that something was very wrong. The man's broad, rather pale face was turned towards Alan, and Alan could not help but notice its complete lack of expression. He wondered what could have moved Bilting to join the parachute regiment. He smiled. Yes, Bilting. As you say, things are a bit dicey. But still, Second Army should be here any time now, and then with any luck, most of our troubles should be over. Bilting took his eyes from Bridgman's face and looked towards the north. He drank the last of his tea and wiped his mouth with the cuff of his smock. He rubbed the inside of his mess tin with a handful of earth and polished it with a piece of flannelette, his mouth pursed and his tongue sucking at his teeth. I don't reckon Second Army will make it, sir. And if they do, there won't be many of the div to welcome them. Someone's stuffed to show up somewhere. He put the two parts of his mess tin together and fitted them back into his haversack. There was not much Alan could say, and while he was thinking of reassuring words, his runner spoke again, his voice as level and flat as ever. It doesn't matter what goes wrong now. They can't blame us for it, can they, sir? Bilting was looking at his platoon commander again, and Alan saw on the man's face the first expression of concern he had ever seen there. He cursed Gordon Brown. Any conversation with Gordon always left him with a stronger feeling of how much the individual mattered than he was happy with. He would miss Bilting if anything happened to him. Alan was happy with men like his Batman, men whose uncomplicated loyalties to their unit were stronger than the fear of death, stronger than the always present urge to avoid the drudgery that is so much of a soldier's life, men whose pride was impersonal, embracing the group and not the individual. Perhaps few of them would have admitted it, but most of the company felt the ties of the tribe that lives a self-contained life of its own. They felt themselves as part of, and yet separate from, 
the rest of the division. Alan felt a sudden lift, as if he'd downed a large whisky. Nope, it won't be our fort building. Come along, we'll get some bandoliers of ammo from HQ and take them round to the sections. They walked together up the rise to do the job that would have been done by Jim Nash had he been there, and both wondered what had happened to the big sergeant and whether or not he was still alive.